Hi, I am Antonio Torralba, computer vision professor at electrical engineering and computer science department at MIT. And I'm going to talk about uh, two different projects that tackle one particular issue. We know that in machine learning and in computer vision in particular, we cannot overstate the importance of data. Data is paramount and, and almost nothing works really if you don't have a lot of data to train it. And what these two projects have in common is that they have a common goal, which is to get rid of this need of having a lot of data. And another thing that they have in common is that these are ongoing lines of work. It means that we haven't reached that goal yet, but I think that the results are very promising and hopefully you'll see that eventually one day maybe we'll, we'll really know. We will not need data. So. In computer vision in particular, we need to have a lot of data. That data also needs to be created in many cases with labels that specify all the different objects in scenes so that we can train computer vision systems to recognize objects and, and, and people and animals and actions and whatever is happening on a particular scene. And of course, the community has worked really hard in order to make unsupervised learning work so that we can get rid of the labels. And so now you have just a big collection of images. You might learn interesting visual representations that allow you to solve a lot of different tasks without needing large amounts of curated data, which is actually very costly to obtain. One example of a, a successful approach in unsupervised learning is contrastive learning, which is capable of learning a very useful visual representation by just using images and learning a representation that is able to discriminate uh, one single image against all other images by creating an augmented set of transformations of that particular image. Like in this case, this particular image of a dog that gets augmented by different versions of the dog by cropping, flipping, changing the colors of that image. And that's the set that needs to be discriminated against all possible other images. And what is really amazing is that this type of procedures are incredibly successful at learning visual representations that, that compete with uh, fully trained uh, computer, vi computer vision systems. But really, our goal is to get rid of images also. Even images are already expensive to collect. They have lots and lots of different issues. There are privacy issues. There's just costly to collect them uh, and collect them with, the, with enough diversity. Um, so we really want to have systems that ideally learn to solve tasks without labels and without images. And OK, this seems like a kind of challenging and crazy uh, goal, but what I will be describing in this presentation are just different versions of our attempts of solving this particular problem. So as I was mentioning, generally computer vision systems and machine learning in general requires a lot of data. And we need millions of images in order to train uh, computer vision systems that are capable of solving visual tasks with pretty with pretty good performance nowadays. And the question really is, how much data is really necessary? Do we need all this data? Can we get away with just very, very little data? And does this data need to be real? You know, reality is full of problems. And can we actually use data that is not real? And what type of not real data can we use? So here is one example of a data set that is pretty popular in computer vision. This is the Cypher data set. And the first task that we had was, OK, you know, these data sets are pretty large. How many images do you really need? Can we reduce the amount of images that this data set contains so that when you train it with a smaller data set, you still achieve the same performance? And, and even more, do, we, do these images need to be real? What if the images were not real? What if these images are? Well, some strange texture images that are just synthesized to achieve the best performance possible. So what we want to do is to compress this particular data set that contains 10 classes into a set of supercharged images where each image is like the ones I'm showing here is just not a real image. It doesn't look real necessarily. In fact, it does not look real at all. But it has the property that it actually condensates all of the examples of one particular class in one to, into one single image. 
And the goal is that this supercharged set of images should be capable of reproducing the original performance of a system trained with a full data set when it is trained only with this small set of images. And of course, we haven't really managed to do this, but I'm going to tell you the direction in which we are going and the steps and the progress that has been made in this particular direction. So this is a line of work that has been in, done in collaboration with uh, Tong Su and George, and, and also uh, Alyosha Efros and Jun Jan Su. And the, initi the initial idea is the following one. You have a data set of images, let's say, a data set that contains 50,000 images, in this case, the Cypher data set, that you use to train a neural network. And what we want to do is to run a process that we will call data set distillation, that will have the goal of taking that data set of 50,000 images and compress it into a small data set of 10 images so that when you train the neural network, you achieve similar performances. There are several ways in which you can actually do this. The first time when we started this project uh, that was uh, led by T Tonsu in 2018, the idea was the following. You start, you want to have a synthetic data set so that when you train your neural network, you are going to create a number of a, a trajectory in the parameter space of the neural network. And what we wanted to do was to follow a particular trajectory so that the endpoint when you evaluate the performance on the real data set, when you evaluate the loss on the real data set, you want that loss to be as 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 high as possible. Yeah, sorry, the loss as low as possible and the performance as high as possible. And then what you do is you just back propagate to the synthetic data set and you change the synthetic images so that you improve the loss. That's actually quite expensive to do because you need to run back propagation through all the different stages that you are running off of training that you're running in order to obtain uh, the parameters of the network. So this process is kind of expensive. And the first attempts were not very successful. Uh, the paper got rejected from all the major conferences. Um, but a lot of people got excited by this, uh, by this idea and started working on developing better versions of this particular uh, task of data set distillation. And in fact, there have been a number of papers that have come along showing that there is actually quite a lot of promise in that, uh, in that particular area of work. So here is uh, our latest uh, approach in order to solve this task, which now works fairly well, still not it still doesn't work as well as the real data itself, but it's getting quite close. So here is how it works. So you start with a, with a real data set that you're going to use to train your, your neural network. As you train it, each time that you run one step of backpropagation, you are going to move along the space of parameters. You are going to follow a particular trajectory. And what you will do, what we do here, is just run this process multiple times by having multiple different random initializations, which will give rise to different trajectories in parameter space. And we store all of those trajectories. So now what we will do is we want to generate a synthetic data set so that it learns to reproduce these trajectories. So what we will do is we will start at some random time t We'll take some of one, one of the parameters that we learn from real data at one particular iteration, one random iteration in our uh, data set of trajectories. And then what we will do is we will run m steps, n steps of back propagation using this synthetic data set. And the loss will be that we want the parameters at the last, last step in this particular small piece of a trajectory, we want that to be as close as possible to the parameters that were obtained by the real trajectory when we were re using real data, starting on the same initialization. And what we'll do is to create then, you know, back propagate through all of these different uh, updates so that we update the synthetic data set. And we will do this for multiple initial uh, points. So we'll have a lot of different uh, points in our synthetic trajectories, and we will then just initialize this in different points and backpropagate by optimizing this loss so that we optimize this particular set of images. And then at each step, we'll get a refined uh, set of synthetic data. So 
what do these supercharged images look like? Well, here is an example of one of the categories in ImageNet. In this case, it contains penguins. And when you compress this particular set of images into a single image that tries to achieve the same performance, in this particular case, this image, what it's trying to do is to achieve, is to produce the same type of learning trajectories in parameter space when it is used to train your system using backpropagation. So what the image supercharged image looks like is this. So this is a single image that summarizes the entire class of images that contain penguins. And here what you can see is that this image, okay, it doesn't look real at all. It looks a little bit texture. And it actually seems to contain multiple versions of the penguins. There seems to be like uh, different bodies and maybe superimposed penguins looking in different directions. And this, I mean, this seems to be like a good summary of this particular class of images. And it's actually quite nice to look at the supercharged images. They look, you know, to my eyes, they look really beautiful. Here there is, for instance, the class of cheeseburger, hot dogs, pretzels, pizza. So this is the subset of images, of classes from ImageNet that, that refer to food. And you can see that they seem to be some sort of a combination of different poses and different uh, styles of the different object classes, object objects that compose this particular class, no? like the hot dog class. No? It seems to have like multiple hot dogs superimposed in some strange way. And that seems to be enough to provide to the, to the learning algorithm with enough diversity in one single image to learn about different poses of the, uh, of the images that you may encounter in the real world. Here is the same thing for dogs. This is fruits. Here is the same theme, but for Cypher, which is this smaller data set that contains images just at 32 by 32. There are 10 classes. Here there are the 10 compressed uh, supercharged images when you compress the data set into one single image per class. But you can also do other things. You can also increase the number of images. We could supercharge more images. For instance, here, we are supercharging all the images in each class into a data set that contains 10 images per class. So here you can see that there is a little bit more of diversity. Each uh, supercharged image now seems to, instead of considering all the poses and appearances that an object class might have, it seems to be kind of grouping them into different canonical poses. And still within each of those, it adds enough diversity to compete to to learn something else about the possible appearances and changes in pose still, still within that cluster. Here is the same thing, but constrained to be 50 images per class. Of course, as you increase the number of images per class, computational cost will also grow. But here you can see also, you know, if we focus on one particular class, for instance, the cars, here they are, the 50 images, you can see that each supercharged image looks more real now, but still it's not a real image. The texture in the background is like a mixture of all different possible backgrounds that each cluster might have. But it gives you a sense of what are the biases on that data set. Now, for instance, here, there seems to be a lot of red cars. Now, there seems to be that is a, a condensing some of the supercharged images to contain a lot of different variations of redness. But at the end, the question is how far are we? How far are we in condensing all of the images from a data set into a single image or a few images so that we reproduce the performance of the original data set? So here what I'm showing is two plots uh, that summarize performance on CIFAR 100 and the tiny images, uh, tiny images ImageNet, which is a small reduced version of ImageNet. And the yellow bar is the data is the performance that you get when you train with a full data set. So in this particular case, you can see that uh, CIFAR is around 55% recognition rate, while tiny ImageNet is around uh, 38 or so. So now what happens when we use the synthetic data set that contains these supercharged images? And here are the results. What I'm showing here is in blue is the performance of the model that I described a moment ago by mimicking the gradient trajectories, the, the backpropagation trajectories follow during training on the real data set. And in red is another competing uh, data set that uh, appear, uh, a different competing approach that appear at the same time. 
And what you can see is that when you charge just one image per class, performances are fairly low, much better than chance. In fact, uh, in, in our model uh, with the blue bar, you can see that the performance is almost a third of the performance achieved by the original data set, which is quite amazing given the fact that you are using just one single image per class. And when we compress the data set into 50 images per class, you can see the performance gap becomes really small. And these are data sets, this compression factor reduces the data set to around 1% of the original data set size. So it's a pretty heavy compression. There are also a lot of applications for this type of approaches, being able to condense a single data set into few images. People have been using this to study privacy, federated learning, continual learning, neural architecture search, and there are many other possibilities that you know, one could use this type of approach in order to, to, build, to build different applications. So, Another thing that we can do, uh, I just want to briefly mention another different type of application, which is we can also condense the images into a single image, but it's larger than the original images themselves. So that when you crop, you know, when you crop this image, you obtain different types of images, supercharged images that we can use for training. So this will be like putting lots of images into a single texture. The idea now will be that when you have your real data set, you can replace this by a single image that is much larger, so that when you crop this image in different ways, you obtain also you can reproduce the performances of the original training set. And here is an example of what happens. These are the supercharged images when we're using just a single image as before, but now when we use this larger texture that you can crop, this is what you get for the same classes. You can see that some of the images are quite fun to, to look at, like the penguins. You now it seems to have different sorts of appearances as you look at different locations in the image. Uh, here is the fruits. When you go from a normal image to this larger image, what you get is uh, something that looks like a texture that contains like different appearances of these objects. They look, again, they look kind of interesting. So now, what can you do with this? Well, if you have an object class like uh, uh, parrots here, you can compress this into a tileable texture, and now you can use this texture to make clothing, and now you can wear your own data set. So this is just another application of being able to compress a single data set into a texture. Now you can wear your data set, and you, know, you are carrying it with you. So in this first part, what I was talking was about, you know, compressing a data set into a few supercharged images. And these supercharged images, they don't look real anymore. They look kind of, they are strange textures. But the problem is that this, you know, even creating these supercharged images still requires using real images. So can we really get rid of real images and train visual systems with no images and labels at all? So do we really need any images? So we have seen that, uh, Contrastive learning can be used, for instance, to learn very useful visual representations. And then you use that visual representation to solve different tasks, like, for instance, image classification that you can do by just adding a linear layer uh, at, the, at the output of your visual representation. And the question then is, how do you get these weights? You can use real images, like in the case of contrastive learning, but what else? What else can you do in order to get these weights so that you don't need to use real images? So I'm going to show some of the results. Uh, first, let me just tell you a little bit what is the benchmark that we will use. We are going to use ImageNet 100 classification task. This is a small version of ImageNet that allows us to train and test systems much more quickly than by just using the original ImageNet. It contains 100 classes. Uh, here they are. And the task is just to classify, to classify one input image according to one of these 100 possible classes. So it's just another way of being able to do um, large scale experiments without requiring the amount of GPUs that generally you know, it requires working with ImageNet. So we hope that these data sets will also become useful. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to develop different ways of training a neural network without images. So the first way that you could train a neural network with no images is not to train it at all. So one thing that you can do is you take your neural network that is, def is this defined by some set of weights, and those weights, generally, when you start training, you initialize them randomly. So one thing that you can do is, that's it. 
you just have your random initialization and don't do anything else to it. That will create a visual representation. It's not going to be very powerful, but it's going to be somewhat useful. And now you can just train on top of it you know, a linear layer, a linear classifier to do the final classification task. In this case, it will be trained to solve the ImageNet 100 classification task. So what I'm showing here, marked with the arrow, is the performance that you get when you use a ConfNet train, not train, actually just using random weights. And the vertical axis denotes the performance. So here the performance is around 21% recognition rate. Chance is 1%, so this is much, much better than chance. Um, but of course, of course, it's not very good. On the other stream, we will have performances that you get when you use real images. But just to make it you know, uh, fair for us, we are going to use real images from a different data set than ImageNet, so that we have an upper bound to the performance that we get with real images without knowing the biases of the data set. So in this case, we are using places, we'll, tr we'll train a visual representation using places and then test it on ImageNet 100. And we get around 55 per percent performance uh, in recognition rate. So these two red lines represent the worst we can do using no training at all and, and what is our upper bound when we use real images that have no knowledge about the final task that we wanted to perform. So what I'm going to do now is think about different ways of training neural networks without real data and see how we close the gap, how we move in performances before between these two lines. And what we'll do is complete this figure by putting different bars that corresponds to the performance achieved when training with different types of processes. OK, so one, one way of training a neural network to learn about vision without having real data is to use simulated worlds. Here there are some examples. Uh, here there are, on, on the left, images that come from the Clever dataset. And on the, on the right, images that come from Minecraft, you can use these images in order to also learn visual representations. And then we can test how well these linear these representations do at the classification task. And here they are. Clever is actually better than a random initialization, by, but not by much. These images look very different from real images, and the performance doesn't seem to be that good. Minecraft is capable of achieving much better performance. Here is about 41% recognition rate, which is like closing the gap to real images quite significantly. But what else can we do? These synthetic walls still require someone generating that content, and that content is complicated to generate. Clever is easy, but Minecraft can be quite complicated to develop. So the question that we have really is, can we learn visual representations by just looking at noise processes. There is actually a very nice example that this type of approaches can be successful, which is this work uh, that uses fractals in order to train uh, visual representations. They use a database of fractal images to train visual representations with different methods, and then they test how well they generalize into the real world. And what we found is that that method actually does much better, for instance, that Clever, significantly better than, than using a randomly initialized neural network. And it's around uh, two thirds of closing the gap with the performance that you get with real data. And the question is, can we do better? Can you learn to see by just looking at noise? And by noise, I don't mean just white noise like this one. I mean noise with some structure to it, but still an stochastic process. We know from other areas also that pre-training with noise is actually kind of, use, kind of useful sometimes. For instance, uh, parallel work in the language domain have shown that you can also train very interesting representations for natural language understanding by just using random sets of text. Nonsense documents that contain just fake words are capable of pre-training some, some architectures to perform fairly well at some simple uh, language tasks. So in this paper uh, that was led by uh, Manel Barard and Baradat, and this is a collaboration also with uh, Jonas Wolf, Tong Su, and Philippe Isola. Philippe Isola is also a professor at MIT. So in this paper, we wanted to explore different ways of generating processes to teach visual representations. 
So let me just start with a simple game. Here there are six images. Three of them are patches from real images, and all, the other three are patches that come from noise processes that we have created. Can you guess which ones are what? So let me reveal the answer. Here you see which ones are fake, which ones are real. And what I'm showing here is the best, one of the base noise processes that we have that is capable of producing images that are stochastic in nature, but that reproduce some of the properties that are present in real images. So one example of a very simple synthetic world um, that was very popular in image processing in the 60s is what is called the dead leaves model. This set of images are composed in the following way. You generate an image by dropping a squares at random locations with random sizes on top of each other, creating occlusions. Each square will have also a random color. And it will create images like the ones I'm showing here. Um, this was actually a very useful set of images that was very popular in the 60s and popularized in the 90s to study properties of natural real images. So here there are a bunch of samples from that particular process. Um, you can actually enhance this process by, for instance, also making the squares be in random orientations. And you can also make it more complex by adding not just squares, but also other shapes like circles, triangles, and so on, like the images I'm showing here. So what happens if we train visual representations using this set of images? Well, here I'm showing the performances that you get. They work better than fractals. And as you increase the complexity of these deadly models, going from squares to oriented squares to arbitrary shapes, random shapes, you get better and better, getting fairly close to the performance that you get with Minecraft. But with a really simple process, these images, you know, the code necessary to describe these images is, is very, very short. But there are other ways of generating other processes that have been also very popular in the computer vision community to study natural images. One of them is this remarkable property of natural images that when you take the Fourier transform of one image, the amplitude always has this shape of one over F. This property was very popular in TV and television studies, for instance, for compressing signals and so on. And it's been also been quite popular in developing texture synthesis algorithms in the 90s, where they just study ways of representing spectral information in different ways and then sampling from those processes to generate images that look like real textures. So we can do that by imposing just some simple statistics. We can look at the spectrum of, of you know, we can take random noise, impose that the noise should have a one over F power spectrum, impose some statistics of wavelength coefficients with also with what all that also are quite constrained on natural images. They generally have this uh, sparse structure. We can also impose color distributions so that they look a little bit more like the dead leaves models, but now with really random and strange shapes. And these are some of the images that get generated by this particular process. Again, the process itself is fairly simple to describe. Here there are some more images generated by this process. So now what happens if we train with this? Well, we get actually better performance that we were getting with the Deadlifts model and now really, really close to the Minecraft performance. And we can do one final thing also. We also have another process that we know is very successful in generating real images, and that's GANs. We know that these generative adversarial networks are really successful at generating images that look very realistic. And part of the reason why they are successful is because the neural network contains already a very useful structural prior that tells you something about how real images work. So we can use this to synthesize also noise. But generally, what happens is that when you synthesize images with GANs, GANs have been trained with real images. And we do not want to use real images at all. So how do you train the GAN on the first place? Well, you don't train it. You just need to initialize the weights randomly and then sample from it, or use cleverer initializations to get more structure into it. And that's what we'll do. So we will just generate different weights that we know match statistics of, of natural images, using similar criteria to the ones I was describing before. So now what happens if you sample from a GAN that is untrained? What happens? These are the images that you get. 
They look a little bit like the images I was showing before, but now they have a little bit more structure. In fact, you can see some 3 dness appearing into them. It's just very shallow, but they seem to look like 3D textures. And if you use these images to train the system, is when you do the best. The performances are actually quite, quite close, um, much better than Minecraft, and closing the gap significantly with, with real images. And finally, another thing that we've been uh, doing lately is another way of also generating synthetic data is by using simple scripts that are capable of generating processes that look very interesting visually, but are not real. These are processes that uh, are called shaders and it's short generative programs written in OpenGL. And they are capable of synthesizing images that have some interesting textural properties. Generally, these are videos that they generate. And actually, if we use a data set of images generated through these processes, but by using a large collection of different processes, we get a really good performance. Closing the gap quite, quite dramatically with respect to real images and all performing all of the other methods quite a lot. In fact, it's quite actually quite interesting to look at the nearest neighbors. So the first row, so the, the problem with what I was describing before is that we were using classification and still classification needed to be trained. But you can use those visual representations just to collect nearest neighbors and then just evaluate how good is the system at using those visual representations to compute similarities between images. In that case, there is no training whatsoever. So the first row here is showing the nearest neighbors for the query images image that I'm showing on the left when you use a network that has been randomly initialized. So here you can see that the neighbors actually, they don't look at all like the input image. There is a little, a little bit of a similarity maybe on the pose of the object, but that's about it. The second row shows what happens when the visual representation has been trained with a style gun. So these are the five nearest neighbors out of a data set of uh, uh, several uh, hundred thousand images. And you can see that now at least two of those five images already contain parrots. And this is the third row is the neighbors that we get when you train with this data set made of shaders, these little programs that are capable of synthesizing processes that look, look interesting but not real. And finally, uh, the last row is just showing the neighbors that you get when you train with real images. And you can see the shaders in this case was remarkable and it was really well. And it has never seen a real image. This visual similarity has never seen a single real image. Here is another example with a different query image. This is what happens when you train, you know, with a random network It's capable of getting like the uh, the blackness of the original picture, but nothing else. Uh, style gun is now capable of producing pretty nice neighbors. The shaders also, and finally places also gets pretty good neighbors. Here is another uh, set of examples. Uh, here each row represents a particular query, and then what you get with random, with a random network on, or when you train with shaders. And you can see the shaders are capable of capturing visual similarities quite well. So what we are showing is that by getting by building these processes, our goal is to be able to develop a process that is completely synthetic, that has never seen a re real data, that it doesn't even contain real content. It's not a, a virtual world that tries to reproduce the, the real world. These are just stochastic processes that generate images that look interesting but are not real. And our goal is to get rid of images and labels in order to train visual visual systems. So we hope that you know the evolution of computer vision data sets that has been looking always into building larger and larger data sets will now become another trend. We'll have another trend where we will start looking into smaller and smaller synthetic data sets that are capable of reproducing the performance of the original data sets of real data sets. So with that, I will stop here. Thank you for your attention.